Hi. This presentation was originally developed for the Control and Sensing Systems Unit of the Electronics Degree Framework at Bournemouth University. It's the fourth part of the section on stochastic processes in a sequence of short videos to support the unit studies in robotics, and in particular the work on Kalman filters for robot localization. The third clip looked at measures of the strength or amplitude of a noise signal, in particular the variance, sigma squared. This clip introduces the time and frequency domain measures of stochastic processes, including correlation, covariance and power spectral density, along with white noise and the covariance matrix used in the Kalman filter. The correlation and covariance functions are time domain measures of signal relationships and how rapidly the signal changes from one time instant to the next. Faster changing signals mean higher frequency components and the power spectral density function is the related frequency domain measure. As discussed in clips 2 and 3, we're assuming our noise signals to have a Gaussian amplitude distribution. With the probability of a signal sample at any instant being in a particular range of values given by the area under the Gaussian bell curve between those values. The total area under the curve being unity or certain probability. And with the amplitude or strength of the signal being characterized by its variance sigma squared, the expected or average value of the square of the signal. We will emphasize zero mean processes having this sort of comparative variation in amplitudes. Remembering that variance is sigma squared, so signal strength effectively doubles for four times the variance. For computer based design, signals are discrete sampled sequences, and in this case, the choice of sampling frequencies is one of the most important system parameters. This slide shows the MATLAB comparison of the two sampled signals. The top one is sampled fast enough to overlap the frequency range under investigation, and the lower sample run is from the same distribution but sampled 10 times slower at 100 Hz. The lower time signal clearly has less high frequency components as is also evident from the frequency spectrum graphs on the right hand side of the slide. It's absolutely convenient, from a mathematical point of view, to consider a noise signal as having infinite bandwidth. So-called white noise, with an even spread of power at all frequencies, is a reasonable approximation to many practical signals. It classically sounds like the shh of radio static, or please be quiet. However, since we are generally dealing with sequences of sampled signals, the bandwidth is limited to the sampling Nyquist frequency the 50 Hz in the lower case. This is so-called band-limited white noise. Here we're looking a bit closer at this comparison of the frequency spectra of what is effectively white noise, sampled at around 16 times the bandwidth, and band-limited noise. The lower time signal is plotted using the MATLAB stem function to emphasize that it's a sample sequence rather than a continuous signal. Notice that the measured frequency spectrum of the noisy signal is also noisy, but it contains all frequencies up to the Nyquist limit. When the frequency characteristics of white noise are combined with a Gaussian amplitude distribution as Gaussian white noise, for a continuous signal it means that it's theoretically possible, albeit is highly unlikely, to go from an infinite positive spike to an infinite negative spike in an infinitesimally short time. Things aren't quite so drastic, however, for the band-limited case uh, that we'll be concentrating on, as the finite sampling time separates each sample value, and ATD converters don't produce infinite voltage spikes. Of course, the dynamics of any practical application will inevitably also limit the bandwidth of the signals involved. For example, this slide shows the effect on the signal and frequency spectrum of passing white noise through a simple low-pass filter, with a gradual frequency roll-off in comparison to the sharper cutoff of the band-limited process. We can now move on to consider measures to describe these time and frequency response characteristics of noise signals to add to the amplitude measure of variance. 
Let's first look at how the signal can be characterized in the time domain by the correlation and covariance functions. A good example of correlation is its use to measure the flow rate of liquids with bits in, such as wastewater, industrial slurry or bubbly cola. Not all equally appetizing. A sensor, such as a photodiode or x-ray detector, looking across a pipe, will give a noisy signal that jiggles as bits get in the way. If a second sensor is located further down the pipe, it will see a similar pattern of bits to the first, but delayed a bit owing to the travel time between the sensors. So, peaks and dips in the time signal of the upstream trace will feature in the time signal of the downstream trace a while later. If the flow is fairly steady and the sensors are close together, the signals will be quite similar as the bits won't have had time to jiggle about too much. Correlation is the process of comparing two such time signals to see how they match up. To do this by eye, we could print out one waveform on transparent acetate, say, and lay it on top of the other, and slide the time scale along horizontally until we find the best match which won't be perfect owing to the random jiggling of the bits between the sensors, but it, this is as good as we can get in this case. Now the horizontal time shift to get this match then gives an indication of the fluid velocity between the known measurement points. It's a good and reliable measure as it involves getting a match of the whole of the signal data along the time range available. The mathematical tool for this job is the cross-correlation function Rxy as defined here. It looks for the relationship between two signals x and y, like the flow meter sensor traces, plotted on time scales that are separated by a time difference, tor, of t1 minus t2, in order to account for possible cause and effect time lags, like the travel time in the flow meter. It's the expected or average value of the multiplication of the two signals. If the signal statistics are stationary, as we're assuming, their statistical averages don't change with time, and the correlation becomes a function only of the difference, tor, between t1 and t2, as we shall see shortly. For a discrete sequence of sample signals, where n is the current time step, and the two signals are separated in time by k time steps, the formula becomes as shown here. The average value you get by multiplying one signal by the other signal shifted along by k time steps. To calculate this ideally, we would take an infinite time sequence, but realistically, the big n steps of the signal trace each side of zero will have to do to estimate the average at a specific value of time shift k. This multiplication and summation calculation is then repeated for every value of the k time steps over which we'll plot the correlation function to represent the process of sliding the one trace over the other and seeing how well they fit at each step. In this example, I'm cheating a bit to demonstrate the principle as the two signals we're checking for correlation are actually the same low frequency noise but where one is set up to lag the other by 5 milliseconds. Each point is calculated as the average of all of the values of the blue signal multiplied by the red signal across the whole time range for a specific value of time step tor from a range here of minus 10 to plus 100 milliseconds. So the first point is found by shifting the whole of the blue trace to the left, like on an acetate, to tor equals minus 10 milliseconds. The traces are multiplied point by point and the average value calculated. Next. The blue trace is shifted one second time step to the right, and the traces are again multiplied together, and the average found, and so on, covering the range up to 100 milliseconds. On the 15th step, the time shift is plus 5 milliseconds. Our plots will line up exactly, and so the multiplication will give every point squared as a positive number, and the average will give a maximum result. At the 16th time step, the blue trace will not overlap exactly, but at this small time difference the signals are pretty close, so at each multiplication we'll have two fairly similar values, and the overall average will still be a positive number, although a bit less than the 5 millisecond value. 
As the time lag increases further, the differences between the waveforms increase, and individual multiplications give either positive or negative numbers, and the correlation result reduces rapidly towards zero. The correlation function here is plotted against the time lag tor using the MATLAB stems plot to show the values calculated by the xcore function. The coef flag normalizes the plot to unity when tor is zero. The correlation result for these two signals not only identifies their relationship, but the peak of the correlation function at tor equal to 5 milliseconds identifies the time delay at which the two line up. The function has many uses, for example, in identifying causal links, such as those between smoking and disease, government programs and economic chaos, university lecturing and mental frailty, etc. Engineering applications include 2G mobile phone equalization, that correlates the transmitted test pattern in the frame of data to the received value in order to find and compensate for the transmission time of the frame, along with many, many other uses. So far, we've looked at the correlation between two different signals. This is called cross-correlation. Now consider what would happen if instead of applying the correlation formula to two signals, we apply it to just one signal. This is the autocorrelation function, the correlation of a signal with itself. It's a time domain measure of how rapidly a signal changes. This slide shows the autocorrelation function applied to the blue signal by sliding a copy of itself along the time axis and forming the correlation function at each time step as though it were two different signals. Unsurprisingly, perhaps, the correlation records the best match when the time lags zero, when the copy overlays the original exactly and the calculation reduces to the average value of the square of the signal. Notice that for stationary signals, autocorrelation is only a function of the time difference tor, and hence the function is even, that is, symmetrical about the tor equals zero point. The result also indicates that the signal is correlated with itself reasonably well for up to around 10 milliseconds before plateauing out. It's a measure of how rapidly the signal changes with time, and it also indicates that a sample taken within 10 milliseconds of a previous measurement will not have had time to travel too far from the original. That is, in a sequence of sample values, values closer to each other than this will be related, and a measure of one value will give information about the other. The autocorrelation function is of critical value in applications such as data compression and coding systems for mobile telecoms, say, where it's important to remove all the redundant information from a signal. This slide emphasizes the result that the autocorrelation function for the special case of zero delay tor is the average value of the signal multiplied by itself, that is, the signal variance, our measure of the signal strength. With sample signals, finding the correlation function is a matter of the summation and averaging of multiplications. With continuous signals, however, this becomes an integration of the available time period, big T, of the data around zero, and the result, as before, is a function of the time lag tor. So far, we've been concentrating on zero mean signals. However, in practice, noise is often superimposed on constant or relatively long-term values, such as a GPS location reading, for example. And to find the statistics in this case, the correlation function is extended to compensate for mean values mu x and mu y in the covariance function, defined as shown in the slide for both cross and autocovariance, similar to correlation. For zero mean processes, the covariance function is identical to the correlation function, and the term covariance is widely used for all. So it's absolutely convenient to consider zero mean processes where the covariance and correlation functions are identical. And in this case, if the autocovariance parameter tor is zero, the result is a signal variance or strength. For the cross covariance of two signals, setting tor to zero gives a measure of the correlation between the signals lined up on the same timescale. Correlation and covariance provide a measure of how fast signals are changing in the time domain. 
An alternative view of the same information is provided by the associated frequency spectrum. The frequency spectrum of a time domain signal is obtained using the Fourier transform. For a stochastic signal, however, averaging measures like variance and correlation are more useful than actual signal values. The power spectral density function is the Fourier transform of the autocorrelation function. This, along with the inverse transformation, form the relations of Alexander Kinchin and Norbert Wiener, which I guess would have been fairly distant in the 1930s. For a discrete sampled sequence, the power spectral density, or PSD, becomes a summation. It's best found using computer algorithms, but care must be taken for the usual FFT issues of windowing and so on, along with a consideration for the noisiness of the signals by applying some form of averaging. The PST describes the power per unit bandwidth of the noise signal, generally in units like watts per radian per second, or perhaps volts squared per hertz for a voltage signal. As the autocorrelation function is a real and even function, so is the PST. The usual caveats about negative frequencies, but note that they are both one-sided and two-sided forms of the PST algorithms. As you might expect, MATLAB has a wealth of functions for spectral analysis, including periodogram and Welch algorithms. This MATLAB tutorial example uses the Welch algorithm, which splits the data stream into overlapping sections that are then averaged. The time signal here is a 200 Hz waveform with added zero mean unity variance amplitude Gaussian noise. A sampling frequency of 1 kHz produces data values at 1 millisecond intervals on the time base from 0 to 0.3 seconds. The first step is to set up a data object for the data samples and parameters for input to the algorithm. This includes applying a windowing function. The default settings are for a Hamming window with 64 sample chunks overlapping each other by 50%, along with a specification of a one-sided PSD running from naught up to the Nyquist frequency of 500 Hz. The PSD call specifies the spectral data object HS, the data X, and the sampling frequency step FS. The results show the expected peak at 200 Hz, and noise power spread across the spectrum. In addition to the PSD, which provides the frequency spectrum of a single noise signal, it's also possible to form the cross-power spectral density by taking the Fourier transform of the cross-correlation function of two different signals. However, owing to the fact that the cross-correlation function is not usually symmetrical, the cross-PSD usually turns out to be complex. Let's now look at some examples of covariance and PSD functions. This slide shows the result of applying the autocorrelation and PST functions to the noise process used in the previous example, that is, Gaussian band-limited white noise passed through a low-pass filter. The autocorrelation shows that the sample value has some 50% correlation to others within 10 to 20 milliseconds or so. The PST shows the frequency spectrum decaying rapidly towards zero at 500 Hz. A two-sided PSD found using the periodogram function with a rectangular window is shown for reference. It shows a similar frequency decay to that of the Welch algorithm, but the Welch gives a smoother response owing to its averaging function. This slide shows a purely deterministic signal, a 10 Hz cosine wave. The autocorrelation shows a repeating signal match every 100 milliseconds. However, it really should be a perfect cosine wave, as the cosine usoidal signal matches perfectly with itself, or plus one correlation, every two pi radians shift along, and every pi radians it matches with its inverse, or minus one correlation. The reason the algorithm goes a bit chirpy here is that our sample time scale is restricted rather than going out to plus and minus infinity. The PSD also is not quite ideal. Theoretically, we should just see a Dirac function at 10 Hz and minus 10 Hz, but there are quite a few jitters in the periodogram. The Welch function gives a smoother response, but this also blurs the peaks at 10 Hz, although adjustment of the averaging length and overlap can improve things a bit. <laughs>
Back to a noise process in this example. Shot noise, like hail on a tin roof or electrons arriving somewhere, say from a photodetector, can give rise to an exponentially decaying autocorrelation, like that shown in the slide top left. The PST of this process is flat, up to the shot pulse time constant frequency. However, there's a general relationship we can see here between the correlation function and the PST. That is, if the frequency spectrum is wider, the signal jitters faster, and the correlation times are much shorter, and the autocorrelation function is then much narrower. Conversely, a narrow bandwidth signal, as in the lower diagrams, contains only low frequencies, the signal changes much more slowly, and the autocorrelation is wide, as samples are closer in amplitude to their neighbours. A broad PSD, then, gives a narrow correlation, and vice versa. White noise is officially defined as a stationary zero-mean stochastic process with a constant power spectral density function over all frequencies. Gaussian white noise has sample values whose amplitude is drawn from a Gaussian distribution defined by its variance, sigma squared. As the spectrum extends to infinite frequency, the autocorrelation only exists at tor equals zero, where the process is infinitely correlated with itself. Since at any value of tor greater than zero, the next sample could take any unrelated value. The inverse Fourier transform of the PSD, therefore, gives the correlation as a direct function of infinite height and area w. Now, the infinite PST bandwidth infers that the signal has infinite power, finite power per unit area times infinite area, as indicated by the infinite height of the autocorrelation function. Hence, the variance is also infinite, implying that sample functions can have infinite amplitude. This kind of also implies that the sample shown on top left in the previous slide, and really the whole darn thing, is actually more than somewhat fictional, although, again, mathematically absolutely convenient. Discrete white noise, though, is defined as a stationary zero-mean stochastic process with a power spectral density function that's constant over the range of frequencies of interest, determined by the sample rate. In this case, the embarrassing infinities disappear. The signal variance is the weighting W of the autocorrelation, Dirac function, and the strength of the power spectral density. The PSD is a function of the sample frequency variable that runs from zero to plus or minus the Nyquist frequency, that is, half the sampling frequency. The discrete process is easy to generate. In this case, a band-limited univariance Gaussian source in MATLAB is sampled at 1 millisecond intervals, limiting the spectrum to 500 Hz. The autocorrelation shows the expected spike at tor equals zero, and the PSD is roughly constant up to 500 Hz and zero thereafter. Signals for modeling and filtering applications often come in bundles, conveniently described by vectors leading on to consideration of vector stochastic processes. For example, we might want a robot vehicle to navigate itself around an area, and hence we're interested in its position. This is modelled as the robot pose, comprising the triplet of variables x, y and theta, where x and y fix the robot position on the map and theta is its heading. It's convenient to represent the pose as a vector x, in bold type, to indicate its shorthand for a vector of variables x1, x2 and x3 for our x, y and theta. Each variable is a function of time and may have both deterministic components from the robot wandering about and stochastic components from noisy measurements and to which we can apply the usual statistical measures. For example, we might want to know the expected or average pose and this is simply a vector of the expected values or means of all the individual variables. To briefly recap, correlation is a measure of the relationship between two different signals on two different timescales, and covariance is correlation with allowance for non-zero mean signals. Now, stationary signals have statistics that don't change with time, and so the covariance only depends on the difference in time between the two signals. Autocovariance is a measure of how rapidly one signal changes in time, and in both cases, 
signals have to be multiplied either by themselves or by each other. However, if we now have vectors of signals, multiplication result in a matrix, in this case the infamous covariance matrix. It's also convenient to deal with zero-mean processes. For the robot case, this can be done by taking the error between the actual and estimated positions, for example. And the covariance matrix then takes this form. It's a square matrix whose diagonal terms are variable autocovariances and off-diagonal terms are the cross-covariances between the variables. Now if the signals involved are white noise processes, things become a little bit easier. Firstly, they're zero-mean and the terms become correlations. Also, the off-diagonal cross-correlation terms will all disappear to zeros as white noise is only correlated with itself and nothing else. The diagonal autocorrelation terms are Dirac functions indicating they only have values at tor equals zero, and the W values are the individual noise strengths. These strengths, as mentioned before, are infinitely contentious but may be conveniently used to represent the relative amplitudes of various noise signals in the kalman boosie filter, say. Now, continuous infinite bandwidth white noise introduces some practical difficulties, but discrete band-limited white noise has finite rather than infinite power and signal variance. It may be possible for off-diagonal terms to be correlated for specific processes and sampling rates, but often they aren't. And the covariance matrix is now a function of the discrete time step k, and the diagonal terms are the individual signal weights multiplied by the Kronecker delta function, the discrete version of Dirac and the weights themselves are the signal variances. Returning to the robot pose example mentioned earlier, the important parameter in calculating the best estimate of the position of a robot is the error E between the noisy data X hat obtained by sensors, modeling, Ouija board, or whatever, and the true pose X. And this can be modeled as a vector Gaussian zero mean white noise process, and the covariance P is defined, as shown, as the expected value of E squared, the matrix of diagonal variances of each component of error. And the filter optimization process then runs to minimize P and so obtain a best estimate of the true robot pose. This slide summarizes some of the main points of correlation and power spectral density. In the next clip, we'll be looking at the basic structure of the state space models underpinning the Kalman filter and the state observer form in particular.